So I think if I were to do a sample of um, the opinion of people in this room, this would probably be the um, <laughs> um And there's even a paper to back this up. And, uh, I would like to convince you to convert these exclamation marks back to a question. <laughs> so why shouldn't there be such things? It's fine, right? Um, there's definitely certain musical features which change through time in kind of popular music. Um, and some are more popular than others. Um, artists know this, and record labels know this, and they exploit this. I mean, if anyone follows the UK chart, you'll know that at the moment, everything has to have a, a dubstep kind of middle eight, somewhere in the middle, in order to be popular. Okay, so there's a positive feedback loop here as well. So artists are knowing this, and then are making the features indeed more popular. Um, and Hits on Science basically just aims to, kind of, to find these features. So I think it should be possible. So this is uh, what we'll be talking about today. Um, just quickly a bit of background about hits on sites, uh, the data that we used, uh, the class description on our learning agents, and the results and interpretations from the paper. If we've got time, I'd quite like to go on to some new results which we've got uh, and find some conclusions. So previous kind of work was somewhat limited because um, collecting a large amount of data on hits songs and pop songs in general is quite expensive. And now we have this wonderful Echonist platform to do stuff. Um, as far as we know, there's been kind of two main studies and one commercial application uh, on this area. The first paper claims there is a signal that they found, uh, the second that there isn't, so there's perhaps not really a consensus here. And this commercial application claims they can do it but offer no evidence or, um, or accuracy measure of the uh, first paper was uh, in his mid-2005 and they found that a combination of audio features as well as lyrics could explain popularity. Uh, they considered just number one hits versus everything else and had an SCM classifier with some boosting um, and a relatively small database by kind of today's standards. But a total of 91 hits they tried to identify and a, a total rock area of that classification of 0.6 miles. <coughs> And then in 2008, a uh, much larger study um, seemed to say that classifying songs into low, medium, or high popularity based on kind of record industry records and chart performance is not possible. Uh, so they use an SCM classifier, and they found the popularity uh, predictions was not significantly better than a random oracle. And finally, there's this uh, uPlayer site which uh, claims that if you upload a file and pay them lots of money, they'll tell you which picture song will be a hit. Or if you pay them even more money, you can upload an album, and they'll tell you which of, their song, which of your songs to release in the series. Uh, but there's no documentation of how this works, um, or how successful it is. They have some amazing results where they predicted that Norway Jones would be very successful after she became very successful. <laughs> so, yeah, who knows. Uh, so talk about the data sources now. Um, in the UK, the, the chart is somewhat a bit more, a bit easier to understand than perhaps like the US chart. We just have one chart which is really well recognised, the official chart. And basically, any um, shop which sells more than 100 singles a week, they collect data from. Uh, they claim to collect this covers 99% of all singles released. Um, it's been very stable since the kind of early days. And um, in 2005, they started including digital downloads as well. So what we gathered was the what we gathered was the top 40 from 1960 to 2010, um, and looked at the position of all singles. So if a song kind of was released in 1970, um, peaked at number five, but then became more popular in the 2000s, again number one, we considered that the lady. Um, and obviously, we couldn't afford to buy every single UK hit and non-hit, so uh, we used the Echonist, just. Um, straight out of the bag, basically, uh, audio summary and uh, analyze API. Um, and from this, we managed to get sort of over 16,000 uh, individual songs, and we collected 15 features for each song. And we just consider these as a bag of features. We have no prior weight on which of these will be more important than others. It's just picking them out of that, basically. Um, from these, we've completed some of our own features, and most of our work is based in chord recognition. So, um, well, first of all, we calculated some kind of variation um, features. So we have loudness and beep variation, basically, tell us the stability of the beep and the stability of the loudness. <coughs> and then two measures based on our predicted chord sequences, given the chroma that we extracted from the equipment. So we have one called harmonic simplicity, which is just the likelihood of the chord sequence. So a sequence which just goes like C, F, G, C, F, G, C, F, G, 
is going to be, given, given an HMM model, is going to be pretty likely. So we assign that a high common simplicity. Whereas ones which have key changes and modulations and uh, weirder chords would have a lower harmonic simplicity. And then we had a measure of how noisy the signal is, basically. So um, we have this chroma that we've got from Echo Nest, and we have our predicted chord uh, sequence for that chroma. We basically measured the, the difference between the, the chord template and the chroma. So if the chroma matches very well to the chord template, then we think the, the sound is quite simple. There's not that too much noise. So we call this measure like the non harmonic It's kind of a measure of the kind of noisiness of the signal. Uh, so our task description is, is not, not that easy to formulate. We have, uh, so we saw, for example, in one that it's made last year that um, the Billboard Top 100 is, has a really large class imbalance. If a song enters the Billboard 100, it's much more likely to do well than not well. Um, so we found that in our data, uh, from the top 40, number of songs that peaked at number 1 to 5 was the same number uh, as peaked 30 to 40 uh, over the entire duration from 1960 to 2007. So to avoid the class imbalance, we considered these, these two different classes, basically. So the task description formally is, given that the song enters the UK chart top 40 and peaks at 1 to 5 or 30 to 40, decide to which of these classes it belongs based on its audio features. And to do this, we used a very simple learning agent, uh, just a perceptron, basically. Um, but the important thing we, we did is we considered the time of release as a feature, kind of. Um, so we, we took all the songs, sorted them by uh, release date, oh, sorry, uh, peak position date, um, and then basically moved this learning agent through time. So basically, we're learning the optimal features through time, instead of just picking out the song at random and deciding if it's going to be a hit or not. Um, so, we think this is a pretty important feature, I mean, like, um, songs which were released in, like, uh, early 60s and stuff, they sound very different to the songs we listen to today. They will have different loudnesses, different chord progressions, all this kind of stuff. Um, so we think this is a really important feature. Um, so this is the algorithm, it's very simple. Um, you put in some samples and some audio features, as well as a memory parameter, lambda, which just tells you how long to remember the kind of optimal <coughs> sample. And we set Lambda to have a half-life of something like six months, um, fair enough. And in goes um, just some empty weights, and uh, you basically go through time and dot product the weights against the features. And um, if you're, if the outcome is not as you expect, then update, update the weights. Basically. Uh, but what's nice is you get the predictions out, but you also get the, uh, the weights. So these W0 to WK are going to tell you the the optimal features for that period of time, basically. <clears throat> so, what's the results from the paper? Uh, so, on the left, you have uh, cumulative performance. So, it starts off a little bit uncertain. This has been smoothed a little bit as well, um, just at a visualization. Um, but you'll notice that this, that given there's two classes, a random performer, a random classifier would get 0.5 um, performance, but we're always above this. Uh, and it stabilizes around 0.56. Um, we've also got the, the classification accuracy per decade with uh, error bars of one standard deviation. So you can see, for example, that between 1990 and 2000, it was easiest for us to predict hits. Um, and also from the algorithm, we get the weights. So we've normalized these weights, and then we can see kind of through time which features are most important for predicting hits, which is quite fun. Um, so you can see, for example, in duration, it seems that there's a switch kind of around uh, the late 70s to kind of have longer songs. Um, so kind of just this far, kind of disappearing and coming up here. So that's quite fun to interpret these things. Uh, I'm going to move on slightly now to a very slight modification of what we had in this paper, which is now we're using ridge regression. Um, so we're trying to predict the rank, not just the, the, the class, basically. Um, and the kind of the fun things you can find in these data are the corners. So uh, down at the bottom left, so this is actual rank against predicted rank. Down at the bottom left, you have songs which we predict will do really well, and and do do very well. Uh, so we call these expected hits. Uh, up in the top left are songs which uh, we predict will not do very well, but in fact score highly on the charts. And interestingly, these are quite often uh, with things like charity singles, 
where you know, the songs themselves aren't great, but there's external forces active in them. Um, and down the bottom right, we have songs which we think are great, but uh, never really made an impact on the chart. And they could be considered kind of commercial failures, but we'd like to think of them as hidden gems for being re-released or covered later in time. Okay, so uh, some results now using this, uh, this ridge regression rather than the um, perceptron. <coughs> so it's, uh, this is a quite detailed graph here of our performance, but basically the dark blue line is our performance through time. So you can see it's always above 0.5, we're doing quite well, but it oscillates through time. Now, over the entire duration of the chart, <coughs> 1 to 5 peak position had the same number of uh, elements as 30 to 40, but this did change <coughs> month by month and week by week. So the uh, dark green line at the bottom shows the, sorry, the light green line shows the actual class imbalance through time. So you can see that when this is close to 0.5, around kind of early 1980s, it's quite hard for us to predict uh, songs well. But when, when it's far from 0.5, then we can do a bit better. Um, so what we found out was actually our uh, learner was learning this class imbalance a little bit, which is a bit frustrating, but also quite intuitive. Because if uh, you have a band like the Beatles who are churning out loads and loads of hits, then there would be more hits than non-hits in that particular time, for example. So the dark blue line at the bottom shows uh, our predicted, our, the class imbalance of our predictions, basically. So you can see it's kind of got a lag on the actual class performance. And to prove that we kind of weren't cheating, the uh, light blue line is the performance you'd expect if you always predicted the dominant class. Um, so you can see this sits always below our dark blue line, showing that um, we're always <coughs> better than, than predicting the dominant class only. And finally, the black line is just the cumulative performance, so it levels out around 60%. Uh, and I also have uh, some interpretation of the weights. I don't know if this is going to work. Um, let's see. It's not going to be good. Mm -hmm. So I shrink it. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we've got the, the features going through time here, and you can see um, kind of which features are important for making hits and which are less important. And you can see how they evolve through time as well. It's really cool. You can see kind of like danceability moving up and down, and energy, uh, and all these kind of features. Um, so it's supposed to run a little bit faster than this, but uh, I think we're pushing the bandwidth a bit. But kind of interpretation of these results is really fun. Um, mm -hmm. You can see that energy is becoming a bad thing in these late days. <coughs> oh no. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm going to have to skip through it. This, this can be a recap. <laughs> I hope that I've managed to convince you that there is a signal here and you know, these kind of things can be predicted even if marginally. Um, but for anyone that's not conv convinced yet, we're actually this morning released the website, scoreahead.com, where we're going to be, we've got all our results, loads of interpretations of them, um, and we're actually going to make predictions every Monday when the UK chart is released. Um, for every song that we can get Echo's features for, we'll make a prediction. Um, and the results page will document our performance, a very similar graph to the one I showed before. Completely honestly, no matter how good or bad it's doing, um, with a kind of monthly summary or something like that. And there's loads of fun stuff on the site. You can see some of the unexpected hits, so like charity singles, some really great songs, uh, kind of uh, expected hits and things like that. And also maybe some source for finding uh, covers to release in the new gems. Um, so the website's something like this. It's, uh, it's got some sort of songometer. <laughs> um, for, uh, for measuring how well the songs are going to do, basically. It's kind of like a heat measure. Um, and we did a, a press release this morning, and this is actually almost got 200 stories worldwide <laughs> already in this. It's really gone out of control. Um, but go and visit it at scorehead.com. Uh, so, the conclusions um, 
We think it's still quite an early science. It's on science, but we think we've definitely found a signal, and we're convinced it's it's not not a random one. Um, there's kind of uh, really, I'd say, you know, now we have two papers for and one against, so probably still a bit contentious, but. Uh, we found a signal using pretty simple machine learning methods, um, and the key we think is the release date, because we had a, a similar size database to the the, um, the paper which couldn't find a, a signal, but they didn't consider the release date. So, um, and our, our website's going to show if we can maintain this. <coughs> so thanks, uh, big thanks to Neen, Raul, and Tel, and uh, this